There can only be one official Highlander RPG. That's right. This is a review of Highlander, a cinematic adventure compatible with the Everyday Hero system. Let's go ahead and dive in. And so here we have the Highlander book, I suppose. I am reviewing this based off of the PDF that I have for all of these cinematic adventures. And let's go ahead and take a look at the back. Matching wit and skill against the greatest masters of the blade ever to live, witnessing history's greatest and most tragic moments, living, loving, and losing those closest to you because you never age, fall sick, or suffer the passage of time. Putting your ageless life and soul on the line in an epic duel, fighting for the fate of all humanity, this is the life of an immortal hero in the world of Highlander. Three exciting new classes are included, perfect for playing immortal or mortal warriors, plus new backgrounds, professions, and feats, origin rules detail creating immortal heroes for everyday heroes, and of course, a dueling system for running unforgettable one-on-one -on -one contests, mechanics for taking your opponent's head, and much more. This book includes a feature-length adventure, A Measure of Revenge, Stand at the side of Joanne d'Arc and help her achieve legendary victory at the Siege of Orleans, then follow a mystery whose threads lead to modern-day New York City, a museum heist, and revenge. This book was, of course, published in 2023, and there we go. We've got our credits, as well as the Serenscape QR code, although even if you scan this QR code, you do need to purchase the tracks themselves, but... There is actually quite a bit of them, and if you're really into that bit of immersion, then this might actually be for you. Before we get in, just like with the Pacific Rim cinematic adventure, the introduction serves as a brief refresher of the Highlander movie. I have actually never seen Highlander, the movie, but I was surprised to learn that there were, like, three movies. I knew about the TV series, but I've actually never seen it. This cinematic adventure book only concerns itself with the uh, the first movie's events as continuity kind of gets a little wonky in the later entries from what I've read, so do be aware of that. Something that is new to the everyday hero system is the addition of Origins. Now normally, you're assumed to be playing as a normal human in the core game, but now you can play as an immortal. Basically, immortals never age after their first death and can only die through decapitation. That also means they regenerate lost HP. In addition, immortals can kind of sense each other and they can sense whenever they're standing on holy ground. There are 17 new backgrounds to choose from, but these are all historic. And this kind of makes sense given that you're likely to play as an immortal who's been around for a century or two, or many. I really like how there is a great diversity. For example, we have the caravan trader, the feudal peasant, religious monastic, Aztec warrior, Carthaginian mercenary, Egyptian charioteer, European knight, Highlands clansman, Japanese samurai, the Kurgan warrior, Lakota warrior, the Malai archer, Mauryan soldier, Mongolian cavalry, Persian immortal, Roman legionary, and the Zhao soldier. There are eight new professions, but we have things like the antiquarian, the crime lord, cult leader, forger, the itinerant, medieval executioner, the salesperson, and the senior advisor. So some of them are quite specific to Highlander, but I feel like the crime lord could have been in the core rulebook. But I actually do think there was a criminal profession, so then again, this is still quite new. And then we have three new classes. The first is the Brutal Warrior, which is a strong hero. A very simple class that aims to deal big damage, even if they miss, but only if you're like level three and beyond. Then there's the Graceful Warrior, which is an agile hero, which it's more of a defensive melee combatant, but their whole big thing is that they can lower the crit threshold significantly by the time that they reach ninth level. So for example, uh, at level one, your crit range is 19 and 20, but then when you get to level nine, it becomes 15 through 20. So that's actually really significant. Last is the Strategist, which is a smart hero, an intelligent warrior that actually has weapons proficiencies. Their new plans involve having transportation to make a fast getaway, bringing a friend to a fight, or even using your intelligence modifier for attack and damage rolls. You also get new historical equipment that fits your immortal warrior from whichever era they happen to come from, but it's really nothing special in terms of armor. 
And then there are 18 new feats, four are advanced feats, six are multi-class feats, that's two for each of the new classes, and then eight immortal feats. These last eight feats are pretty interesting because you can actually acquire them by spending five spirit points. What are spirit points? Well, let's head on over to the new rules and find out. Because Highlander is about fighting other immortals, decapitating them, and acquiring their power or their spirit, it only makes sense that there'd be a new mechanic tied to the quickening. Whenever an immortal decapitates another immortal, they get a spirit point. And when you get to five, you can actually spend them to purchase one of those immortal feats. It's a very nice way of keeping the theme of the quickening without allowing PCs to get as overpowered as they're going to be by being an immortal. There is a new dueling mechanic that adds a little bit of a strategic minigame. Each duelist chooses a strategy that's tied to one of their ability scores. They reveal which strategy was chosen and consult the chart. What you're really looking at is to see which ability score will be taken at value. Whoever has the highest ability in that area is the winner for that round and they get some kind of an edge. Edges can be used to gain an increase to your defense for that round, lower your opponents, gain advantage on any d20 roll you make, or even take half damage from an opponent's attack. I like this mechanic because it turns something that can be very dull and turns it up on its head by making it into a head game. Do you try to anticipate your opponent or do you stick with what you know in the hopes that you can outmaneuver your opponent? Decapitation is the last major rule. Since an immortal can only die from being decapitated, there's got to be an easy way to do that. Right? Uh, sorta. We have what is called the decapitation challenge which really comes down to a d20 plus the attacker's total attack bonus with their weapon versus the defender's constitution saving throw. If the attacker wins, well, it's pretty much straightforward after that. But if the defender wins, then they get to keep their head for a little while longer. And here comes the obligatory spoiler warning. If you are a player who's going to play in this game someday, then go ahead and ask your GM for permission to watch. Otherwise, you're only spoiling yourself. A Measure of Revenge serves as the adventure for this book. It is set in a typical three-act structure with the setup in Act 1, the investigative bits in Act 2, and then the resolution in Act 3. Act 1 actually starts off in the year 1429 in France during the Siege of Orleans. The PCs are tasked with protecting a little peasant girl by the name Jeanne d'Arc. The PCs gather information, talk to other soldiers in camp, and learn just how hopeless their situation is. In addition, the PCs are to determine if there's anything to Jean d'Arc's visions. In the end, she is betrayed by the Spaniard Yago Ortiz Bailen, who is then killed by the PCs. Act 2 takes place in the modern day in New York City. A museum is burgled and several items that were associated with Jean d'Arc have been stolen. A piece of paper was left behind with the PCs' names and the police want to know why. The PCs go about their investigation while the police do theirs, and they must track down Jean d'Arc's banner, the Dolphin's Crown, the Journal of Sir William de la Pole, which if translated properly will implicate the PCs as being immortal, and Jean d'Arc's sword, Legende. Three of the items can be found through proper investigation, but her sword is held by none other than Iago Ortiz Bailen. Or is it? My favorite of these investigative bits has to be when the players go in search of the banner because it's actually being held by their former mentor from 1429 back in France, and he's actually being exploited by this church that's, that his wife runs. It kind of gets a little wonky and weird how the players go about obtaining it. They can, of course, talk to their old mentor and basically convince him that there's something wrong with his mind and bring him back from his, uh, his psychosis and whatnot or they can just go through like nefarious means to getting it. And it really is interesting all the different ways that you can go about obtaining this banner. In Act 3, the PCs confront Yago, who turns out to be Amaldo Bailen, his immortal nephew who wants revenge on the PCs. He has set a trap and would force the PCs to duel him one by one, killing them with Jean d'Arc's sword. Overall, I really do like this adventure. I like that it starts in the distant past to set things up. If I was to turn this into a full-length campaign, I would definitely play around with the mystery of Yago's emergence before he's revealed to be Amaldo. 
And there's just so much room for great storytelling in this one. And I actually do like how organized it is with the different scenes. Pacific Rim did this too. At the very end of the book, we have the cast. So this will be all of the NPC stats for the characters in the adventure itself. But then later on, we do get stats for the actual movie stars. So we've got Connor McLeod, who is in the first movie, as well as Ramirez, the Kurrigan himself, and then we've got some pre-generated heroes, like Tor or Tora, a Viking, uh, M. Quasi, who's a Muslim soldier, O. Ito, who's uh, from feudal Japan, F. Martin, who is like a nobleman, and they've got S. Jung, who's from Germany, and there we go. Once again, I'm actually amazed by this cinematic adventure. The new player options feel very thematic in a historical sense, as do the new rulings. I was a bit worried about this one because the players are playing as immortals, who don't die quite so easily. The book has some tips on how to make that interesting, but basically, don't just have them go from one immortal to the next. Actually play around with regular humans who might discover their secret, or maybe interrupt the flow of the PCs trying to live a normal life. That is, if they have one. Other than that, this book doesn't really bring a whole lot to the everyday hero system, if you're more of into a historical type of a game, then yeah, you might actually like some of the equipment here, but unless you want to play as an immortal who's going around, I don't know, beheading others, then this one isn't really for you. It's kind of very niche in that sense. But hey, if you're all up for some Highlander adventures, then yeah, this one would definitely be for you. And that's going to do it for this video. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Give this video a huge thumbs up to support this series. And I will see you guys in the next video.